one of the many things that uh, make you fascinating is uh, you've played with diet as well. And you're um, somewhat famous, I would say, for doing low carb or playing with low carb or meat-based diets. Can you describe the potential, like where, how you're thinking about that has evolved and the potential beneficial role of a carnivore diet or a keto diet or a meat-based diet in training as an ultra marathon runner? Yeah, and I think like where a lot of times things get confusing for people here is the context of it too, where it's like they want an answer as to what do I eat for endurance sport? And it's like, well, endurance sport is quite wide ranging as we've yeah. talked about many, many times here. So there's gonna be differences, I think, in just like what you wanna maybe necessarily prioritize uh, both for the event you're doing and the intensity that's required for it, the training that's required for that event. And then also the individual component too, where I think this one often gets overlooked, where we tend to say like, well, we've got all these Olympic medalists at the marathon and below distance who are, you know, eating a moderate to high carbohydrate diet. So everyone needs to do that if they want to reach their potential in, you know, say the 3K to the marathon. And, you know, in a perfect world, maybe that would be true, but there's a lot of other variables that often get forgotten then that could positively or negatively impact that decision choice. So I think uh, Dr. Jeff Volk has done a great job of kind of highlighting this in the sense that, you know, when he works with people, he works with people in the health sphere as well as the performance sphere. And, you know, he's one of the main guys at Verta Health who's, uh, they've got like a 60% uh, success rate with working with folks with uh, type 2 diabetes to um, reverse their type 2 diabetes. Uh, and I mean, that's an astounding, when you, th when you think of just any nutritional protocol, it's success rate, they're all incredibly low. They're very, very low. And the big difference with his is the coaching aspect of it. Like they give support. So these people like have someone to turn to when they make a mistake or if they're thinking about doing something differently or they don't know what to do rather than just kind of throwing throwing it all up in the air and quitting, they, they, they have a resource there. And that's probably a big reason why that's the success rate that they have with that is they put those support mechanisms in place. That picture needs to be carried into the performance world or the running world too, where, you know, we may have just been identifying that, uh, you know, Olympic distance athletes that can tolerate a very large portion of their diet coming from carbohydrate is going to just, it's going to filter those ones towards the Olympics, <laughs> filter those towards Interesting. the event. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't mean that like, uh, if we would have taken say the gold medals in the 5k and put them on a low carb diet, they'd run faster. They probably wouldn't because we may have already selected that that person's thriving on carbohydrate. Mm. Uh, what I would be interested in is like, you have, let's say we have someone with equal talent, but got weeded out along the way, potentially because for whatever reason, they just weren't able to tolerate like the, both the training and the nutrition requirements that they're being told to do. So the coaches kind of, there's a culture where the coaches would really push a carb heavy diet and that mm -hmm. that would in itself would do the filtering process of people that are not, it would filter out the people that are not able to tolerate carbs as part of their training. I mean, I might be an example of this actually where, you know, you take someone where uh, they, for whatever reason, the carbs aren't working for them, like it's unsustainable for them to continue that path. Or if they do, they might have a shortened career. So they might be able to eke out a few really good years, but then, you know, they're not gonna be the person they're like, wow, that person's 38 and they're still competing at the Olympics type of a person. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you put them on a low carb diet. Uh, if you can control everything else, like their entire lifestyle is based around training and racing, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, they may still have better potential by introducing carbohydrates at a higher level. But if that's not going to, if that's not going to be sustainable for them as a person, then, you know, what's the point kind of at that, unless they want to be like a kind of a, a spark in the pan, so to speak. I just feel good eating meat performance wise. Well, uh, I think there's that group too. And they, they may just not be the Olympians. The, yeah. And so we're not talking... <laughs> I guess this conversation has several layers. One is for the Olympics and mm -hmm. one is for like, what is it? Active athletes that are like amateurs, whatever, whatever category I put myself into, like people that exercise regularly. And then um, maybe people, and then there's people who like exercise rarely. Mm -hmm. So on all of those fronts, I mean, do you think it's possible to live a happy, uh, active life eating meat only or mostly meat? 
Yeah. What have you learned about this? Yeah, I think uh, so for for some context, like I followed what I would call a low carbohydrate diet for the last 10 years. And just like kind of the training, I periodize it to a degree where there are parts of my training where I do bring back a little more carbohydrate. And there's periods of my training, especially like the off season where I'm like very low and I might be like kind of in that ballpark of uh, like, you know, ketogenic, strict ketogenic or no carbohydrates for, for periods of time. And what um, kind of food are we talking about? What's, um, a, what's a strict low carb diet? I've ranged everywhere from like mostly plant-based low carb keto to like mostly animal-based. I very rarely gone much more than like two weeks strict where it's like I'm strict carnivore or strict plant-based or anything like that. Like we're talking probably more like 95% at the, at the peak um, in terms of any type of like, like longer lasting uh, from my personal experience of like being like either in like the animal food camp or like the plant-based camp kind of a, of a process. Um, so I've tried all of them. Things that stayed consistent over the 10 years is a kind of the macronutrient profile that mm -hmm. I've done throughout the course of- So one didn't win over the other in terms of meat-based versus plant-based? Oh, for me, meat-based definitely. What was, I mean, I was, I was my highest meat consumption in 2019 and that was by far my best racing season. Yeah, we keep, we keep coming back to that year. That was a good year for many <laughs> reasons, philosophically and nutritionally. <laughs> Yeah, well, 2020 happened, and now I haven't had a really good chance to <laughs> to, to, uh, to improve. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully, yeah. I've got some more. Yeah, <laughs> some more in the tank. That's strange. There's uh, so most athletes that compete at your level uh, have more carbs integrated into their diets. So, what have you learned about using meat in uh, high performance? I think it's maybe less about the meat, and it's more about like what are you, what is it replacing? So, if we go, if we step away from like me specifically and just like the people that because i mean we're getting to the point where i get it's anecdotes but like like that's what we have at the moment because there's i mean there is a actually a study being done on like i think i guess they call it hyper carnivore where they're like i think above 80 percent of their intake from meat. It's meat um and they're looking at a few different things there but it's so weird and i keep interrupting but it's so weird that it sounds unhealthy uh hyper carnivore yeah but it makes me feel really good <laughs> And so I, it's the individual thing, right? Yeah, like, the individual I mean, there's, thing. I, there's countless people now who like, and, and I'm not saying that they could not have found another route, myself included. Like in 2011, when I switched from moderate to high carbohydrate to low carbohydrate and saw some very noticeable differences in the way I felt, the way I performed and all this stuff, that doesn't mean that there wasn't another path. I just did not find that path. And the, the, the fact that I found a path that was producing the results I was looking for is really all that matters in my mind. You know, like I don't really care if there was a parallel path that works just as well or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. Because ultimately we only have one shot at everything yeah. we're doing. So like, it'd be, it'd be great if I could go back and try four or five different things. Well, but. the annoying thing is that the the body adjusts to whatever the heck you're doing. So mm -hmm. you can't, it's hard to do good science even on yourself. Yeah, I've referenced my 2019 racing season a few times and it's like, it'd be silly for me to put all of the emphasis on my nutrition plan for that because it's also comes with two decades of endurance training. So mm -hmm. it's possible and it's very likely that a huge portion of that success was just the culmination of a lot of work over time from the training side of things. I just think like anytime you hyper-focus on one area or pick a couple variables and just target those, you find yourself in a position where you are, you're putting other things in the most uncharitable light possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so then you have this situation where like, it's actually a combination of a variety of different things. So where are the big movers? And, you know, for me, nutritional shift was pretty clear that that improved my sleep and my recovery. And I mean, people can say, well, there's the placebo effect, which is a very real concern. But, you know, for me personally, a 10 year placebo effect would be a quite lengthy placebo <laughs> effect. Um, and it, I do think it's individual though. I, I, I emphasize that a lot because I mean, I've worked with tons of people with this and I do see a range from person to person. I've worked with people who come to me and they're like strict keto and we raise up their carbohydrates a bit and they're like, okay, I feel way better doing it this way. And I've worked with people who they come to me, moderate carbohydrate, but they're interested enough. Um, they, they want to try a lower carb. So we, you know, we titrate them down and I've had clients where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna give them this workout and they're gonna wish they brought back a little bit of carbohydrate and then they go and they nail the workout and I'm just like baffled that because, <laughs> yeah. because they're different from me. And I, every time, you know, when you have your own personal experience, the first kind of guttural response is, oh, if I had done it, it would have gone this way. Why did it go the complete opposite way for them? 
And you kind of have to just kind of step out of your own perspective a bit and say like, okay, well, they're different, you know, for whatever reason, they're getting getting along like this. I've had like several moments in my life where you kind of realize the body is weird and it's weirder than the average advice. Like one of them is how well I perform for my own standards when I fast. Uh, first of all, intellectually, but that's more known and, and understandable, but like physically. Yeah. The fact that I could train, like not eat 20 hours, 24 hours, and then do a hard like jujitsu session for like two hours, like hard. Mm -hmm. It's incredible to me. Like this makes no sense. Cause I used to eat like many times a day. Of, of course you have to eat, like you don't wanna eat too close to the training session was my thinking, but you definitely need to load up on carbs like three hours before, like in order to have enough yeah. energy. <laughs> the fact that I could not eat and have like incredible focus, but also athleticism, like both endurance and explosive. I mean, jiu-jitsu is a special thing. It's like more like chess. Yeah. It's not like powerlifting. No, not powerlifting, Olympic lifting, where it's like true explosiveness. But that's fascinating. And it makes me wonder like, what other things are there to to um, to discover about yourself? The, the annoying thing about food is it's delicious. <laughs> and so it's hard to do good science on yourself. Mm -hmm. Like to do, you know, for two weeks or a month to do like strict, no carbs, and then maybe next month you add 20 grams or 40 grams of carbs and see how you actually feel. Right. Not like in that moment, but over a period of several weeks and then doing everything else like, right with based on best available science, like with little electrolytes and then vitamins, but then also like remove all the humans from your life that affect you yep. <laughs> positively or negatively because you might feel amazing because you're hanging out with cool people and then, uh, you know, like removing basically all the variables it's kind of fascinating and you kind of all of us land in a place where we find something that worked for us and then we maybe use some of the placebo effect to help us out mm -hmm. to stick in that place and then uh i suppose that's the way to live life like it's, it's yeah. impossible to find the optimal for any of us but carnivore is an interesting new kind of caveat a new challenge to the nutritional community because more and more people seem to be doing well under carnivore yeah. Well, the nutrition community is probably like, we just got done like dealing with the vegans. And now we got this opposite end of <laughs> yes, the spectrum coming exactly. at us. But I think, well, I mean, what this all tells, <laughs> what this all tells me is like, there is uh, for one, like in our food environment, like the failure rate of any one approach at a population level is going to be incredibly high. I mean, it's why we have, you know, what is it like 88% of the population has some sort of like metabolic syndrome. And it's, it's like, you know, it's because there's an endless quantity of everything that you can get your hands on for relatively cheap. Um, and I think that's that that presents a problem if your mindset is gonna be, we need this set of parameters for nutrition and everyone needs to adhere to that or you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, tell that to the person who like went carnivore and cleared up some like crazy skin ailment or something yeah, like that. That's or, a weird one. Yeah. Like where <laughs> the carnivore seems to treat like, like depression, uh -huh. it's like yeah. like mental stuff. It's yeah. fascinating. There's all these stories. Again, it's anecdotes, but it's like the mental one. I think may I'm I'm stepping out a bit on a limb here, but I I want to say like some of the research of uh, Dominic Diagostino and and Jeff Volick was looking at the ketogenic diet, which a carnivore diet is basically going to be a part of a ketogenic. I mean, you could always go like way too high on the protein, I guess, mm -hmm. but most people that I see doing carnivore, they're cognizant enough that at least if they're doing it for therapeutic reasons, they're not going like, you know, 50% protein, 50 percent they're more like 70, 30, 80, 20, something like that. And, and I think like you, you do see some, some work with like the brain and so the mental stuff. I know some of the, I, I'm not sure if this was part of the DARPA funding that, that Dr. De, Dominic D'Agostino had, where they were looking at things like mental stuff, like post-traumatic stress disorder and that sort of stuff with with like a strict ketogenic diet. So I wonder if some of that, mm. like the depression related stuff has to do with that where now like their body is just fueling their brain differently than maybe they were in the past. But um, that's just, you know, wild guesses on my part.